If you love our crypto content or are looking to learn even more about crypto, be sure to check out and subscribe to our new YouTube channel after this video dedicated to all things crypto. Find new videos every week. Be sure to check the link in the description. Dan, look, as ever, always great to get you on Real Vision, and this time it's on Real Vision Crypto. So we're going to kind of leave a bit of the macro world behind. Okay. Because you and I have both been down this journey together, and it's been... Fascinating. Yeah. And people have seen it on Real Vision, us both going down the journey of you dragging me back in and that great conversation that we had. Now, things have changed for you because you've now gone even deeper into this. Much like many of the macro guys, you've gone from being an observer of the space to an investor of the space, and now you're going all in on the space. Do you want to talk us a little bit about what you're up to? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we kind of, uh, you know, you've been an intellectual sparring partner of mine for years and years. And uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, we really hashed that thesis out together. Um, and that was sort of the the initial stage of me falling down that rabbit hole. Um, and so, yeah, after the initial sort of Bitcoin um, position in Q1, Q2, 19, um, you know, I really started to look around for what else I could do. And, you know, given my background and experience, um, you know, I, I really wanted a sector bet. You know, I was sort of blown away like you by how, it, you know, how intelligent some of the people were in the space, all the different projects that they were working on. Again, very hard to understand. Uh, I don't know that you and I could have a, a really high level conversation uh, about polka dot or even Ethereum. I mean, it's it's very high, uh, very complex. And I just found myself continuing to hit a wall. Uh, Bitcoin, I could understand because there's very strong macro component to it. A store of value is very, you know, the Bitcoin network that we talked about, um, the value of, of that network. Uh, especially in the, you know, after the first five, six years, really, uh, I think has become, you know, established. Uh, but th there are lots of interesting things going on that are valid. Uh, and so I wanted to find a way to, to uh, dig in and, and, and figure out a way to get involved because I'm just sitting there with my Bitcoin and that's wonderful. Uh, but what else? And so I came up with this idea uh, for this fund that we launched 10T Holdings um, launched just a few weeks ago after a year plus of work. Uh, and it really is a, a sector bet. It's a, it's a classic bet that I've done before. I sort of did it in the ag space where when I was working with Druckenmiller, we aggregated uh, a, a whole a group of farms, uh, built a farmland REIT, and that became sort of our bet on the farmland sector. Uh, we held that for seven years and had a fantastic exit. And so I was looking for that sector bet, and I didn't feel that there were enough. Of course, there's there's Novogratz's Galaxy. That's one a public company. I thought about taking a position there, but I didn't feel it had as widespread uh, um, a widespread um, a, 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 as widespread an emphasis as I wanted, and um, I wanted exposure to several different sectors. And I figured I'd build a portfolio of companies that were active in that space. Um, and so I've sort of divided this whole world into uh, three categories, digital asset ecosystem, gateways, next generation. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I wanna tell you something important, is I can tell that you really wanna learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Space. Um, and so I've sort of divided this whole world into uh, three categories, digital asset ecosystem gateways, next generation financial services, and blockchain infrastructure companies. And 10T is very simple. We're just building a portfolio of 10 to 12 
uh, companies overall, three to five, let's say, or three to four companies in each space. And they're companies that are mid to late stage. Uh, they're larger than $400 million in valuation. Um, you know, they have, let's say, 30 to $50 million in revenues or larger. They've established moats. They have leadership teams. They've already figured out how to win. And the reason I, I've done this is because uh, the funds in the space, for the most part, are all VC and focused on early stage. And I really... <laughs> I don't really have any ability to add value there. And I can't, I can't compete against an Andreessen or a Polychain or a Paradigm or Parify or any of the guys in the space uh, today. Um, I don't have a programming background. Uh, I can't get into the arcane details of the protocols. And frankly, the people I know and my investors really can't either. And so, this was really a simple way for me to express uh, a bet on the space and, and for, for me to be able to explain it in simple terms. These are companies you will own. There is an income statement and a balance sheet. There is a CEO, there is a team, this is their project. So any 60 year old guy uh, who knows something's going on in Bitcoin, something's going on in this digital asset world, they're not quite sure they can't wade in because there's too high a barrier, an intellectual barrier for people to really understand. I mean, try to figure out the difference between Polkadot and Chainlink or actually how Polkadot works. And I listened to a podcast recently with Gavin Wood. I mean, I've listened to it three times and I'm still not exactly sure because, you know, I, I, it's interesting, but I don't really know. However, Owning companies that are leveraged to the growth of the overall digital asset ecosystem seems like an easier way for me and other people like me to get exposure. And I really feel, last thing I'd say is really, I really feel like I'm bringing a whole new investor base, investor class to the space. People who would not necessarily come in, but who are sitting on very large pools of capital. And so I think the fund is sort of a, a nice toe dip for our uh, for our uh, LPs and, and investor base, and then if they want to explore certain things uh, more, that you know, then then they can. And so that's what I've been busy doing for the building building that business for the past year, and we've launched and. Yeah, I mean, super interesting. I mean, that that later stage idea, you know, as we're going into the Coinbase IPO. <coughs> You know, people are starting to see there is massive value embedded in some of these businesses. What I want to cover with you, you talked about the three key areas. I'd love to let's go through those key, key areas. So we talked about the the gateways. Um, you talked about, well, let's go through the three areas that you discussed, because I think that's interesting to dig into to see what your thoughts are on them, how you think about them overall. Because again, at a top-down level, you and I can't get into the weeds about the technology because we just can't. <laughs> but right. it's the conceptual framework of what this is all about and where it might be going. I think it's going to be interest people. Yeah, look, I mean, these are completely these are categories that we came up with. Uh, other people have broken this world down into many different categories and seven, eight different categories. Uh, you know, some people now have a tremendous focus on the gaming or NFTs. Uh, there's, you know, of course, also uh, DeFi is has been on fire, so people are focused on that. There are people who are Bitcoin only, and they're only looking at things that, um, you know, Bitcoin type solutions. Um, there are, you know, so there are many different, you know, there are many different ways to carve this world up. And I think the reason we came up with what we did was just simply because um, the companies that are larger fit into these categories for us, right? So there are, again, there are only 35 companies that we see that have a valuation over 400. We're going to own, you know, 10 to 15 of them. So um, the first one is sort of just traditional. You know, I would say the on-ramps into the digital asset world. I mean, Coinbase, of course, is one. Uh, we won't own Coinbase because it's already... Uh, you know, it's already on path to, to being public, but there are other exchanges uh, that would be uh, in the exchanges that you know, um, you know, a Bitstamp or an eToro or, a, 
you know, Kraken. Kraken I mean, these are right. Any any of the exchanges that would be sort of one category. Um, and I might even put BlockFi in that category too. They've just done a raise of at two point eight billion. I think they really are sort of the, the uh, blue they're the blue chip you know leader in the borrowing and lending space. And so, um, you know, I would sort of categorize them almost as a gateway as well. Um, so we've broken it, as I said, we've broken it down because it, 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 those areas, um, you know, are populated with companies at the size that we're looking to, to invest in. Now, to talk about these gateways, these exchanges, where does the moat lie in these things? Because, um, you, you know, obviously you've got a fungible product that can trade on multiple exchanges. How do these guys adapt as they move forwards? Well, it's a little bit as you talked about before and have talked about recently about network effect. Um, you know, Coinbase as an example uh, is sort of the retail interface in the US. Um, so in the US, it, it's dominant, you know, over 35 or $40 million clients. Uh, they've already um, they've already figured out how to win in that space. And they've also been, in my mind, a lot of these companies are, are really budding conglomerates too. Uh, you know, two years ago, they didn't have custody. Then all of a sudden they see that custody is interesting. They pivot there. Um, uh, next, they, they see that a borrowing and lending is taking off. So they, they pivot there. All of a sudden they offer staking. And so they're all different kinds of um uh, different kinds of things that they do. So we, you know, we think of them as an exchange, but I'm really sort of betting on them as, you know, th these are the these are the best teams in this category, and they will pivot if they need to. Do, do you think they head towards becoming investment banks? So or something some of them, even yeah. Than that? Yeah, I think. Look, the the space is really evolving and growing at, at an enor you know, enormous speed. So I think some of the companies could actually be purchased by some of the existing investment banks. I mean, Morgan Stanley is an example, bought E-Trade for $12 billion uh, a year and a half ago. They could have bought Coinbase at the time for 7 billion, right? And now, now Coinbase is, you know, could be 30, 40 billion. I know there was an announcement today, it's trading at 70 billion. Um, so I think some of these larger, you know, guys in the legacy world might, you know, might try to step in uh, and purchase them. Some, you know, some have ambitions of, of being an, a, a sort of old style investment bank, uh, but some don't. I mean, someone like Kraken is really a, a favorite for active traders. You know, there's great liquidity, all sorts of different products. They're really cutting edge, super secure. So each one of these, um, gateways focuses on different things. I don't think Kraken is trying to be a Coinbase, right? I don't think BlockFi is trying to be a Kraken. They've they've sort of developed their own niches. And so, you know, is is there a moat? Well, there's a moat insofar as, as an example, Kraken has been in business for over nine years. I mean, they have a very They've spent tens of millions, if not more, on building that infrastructure. I mean, I don't think an asset like that is actually replicatable today. You know, I spoke to I spoke to Jesse a while ago. I mean, yeah. the poor guy's exhausted. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, they've had um, they've had quite a few uh, blowouts. I I heard from somebody recently that a few weeks ago uh, their uh, their 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 Dogecoin trading went up 20x in one day, and it sort of blew out the system there. I mean, don't quote me on that, but um, I mean the volumes, as we know, have exploded. Um, but you know, they're sort of they're you know they're, they're 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 built to take that. And so what I mean is is that building that arc the infrastructure, you couldn't do that today. You can't start from. I mean, I think BlockFi is a little special in that they're a younger company, but they really carved out the borrowing and lending space. They didn't seek to compete head to head with a Coinbase or a Kraken or, or, and, or even Binance. I mean, throw Binance in there, you know, they really are the juggernaut in the space, but they're not really in the US. Um, they're doing over a lot more than 50% of total world volume, but it's outside of the US. And so, 
you know, I don't, I think Binance would have a very hard time if you talk about moats, uh, you know, competing with a Coinbase or a Kraken or even a BlockFi in the US. So there's also geographic diversity that we're going to bring to at least to our portfolio because each of the different areas have different, you know, rules. The jurisdictions have, you know, also the, the, the clients have different needs. I mean, South Korea is a gigantic market. I can't tell you, you know, um, that I've got tremendous expertise there, but, you know, there are companies there that service South Korea that are enormous, um, but that aren't really active in the U.S. So it, it breaks down by geography as well in terms of, you asked me about the moats in this particular space. Yeah. Okay, so um, so what's the next bucket after these gatekeepers? What's the next bucket you have? Well, you've got next generation financial services, and that's sort of a you know a broader uh, category we came up with because there are lots of things going on in the space that are not gateways strictly, and they're not infrastructure. You know, Figure would be an example. Um, they are super uh, plugged in, and and they actually use the blockchain. I hate to use blockchain technology to power their mortgage lending platform. And all of a sudden, within, uh, you know, just a handful of years, you've got a billion dollar company uh, run by Mike Cagney. I mean, who's had tremendous success uh, previously as an entrepreneur. And they're really doing some super innovative stuff. And um, I, you know, I can't get into the weeds uh, on that right now. But I mean, I think that uh, it's a unique company, and they are taking that whole uh, mortgage space, uh, you know, by storm. So um, we, we think that they're, you know, that they're going to be a, a powerhouse in the next sort of three, four, five years. Another company, I mean, like take a look at BitGo, for instance. They're a pretty strict custodian, but they're branching out into other areas as well. So I wouldn't call it necessarily a, a gateway. It's more of a, a, a custodian. Um, Another company, look at Barry's DCG. Um, DCG is really a conglomerate. I mean, it, it, I don't know that it's, he's not really focused on being a gateway. He's, uh, you know, an, an over-the-counter uh, market maker. He's moved into borrowing and lending. He has the Grayscale Trust. He has the publishing and events business. And so it's a, that's really like a, a financial, uh, I would call it like a, crypto conglomerate powerhouse. He's added right? mining as well, hasn't he? And he has, and he's launched a big uh, mining uh, project as well. So, um, you know, he's doing tremendously well. I, um, um, you know, it's it's not that easy to procure a block of, of stock uh, uh, in the secondary uh, and it is expensive, but it does, it, it, you know, it, it is out there and there is a valuation out there. So, um, you know, also, the, the market for the secondary has improved uh, versus, you know, three, four, five years ago, there were very few uh, brokers in the space. Some people now are moving to it. But I will say this, look, we are the first fund that I'm aware of that focuses exclusively on mid to late stage digital asset ecosystem companies. Mm. So all the other funds you have, you know, you have growth equity funds writing one-off checks into the space. I mean, Tiger and Co2 and some of the bigger guys, uh, you know, in, in, I think it was in Q4-18, uh, participated in that large Coinbase raise. Um, but I think for most of the growth equity guys, it's a little weird crypto. You know, they're not quite comfortable with cryptocurrency. Uh, I think you need to underwrite a macro scenario, uh, have a macro view. And a lot of these guys, don't necessarily. I mean, they, or maybe they do, but they don't really have a lot of comfort. Um, but to me, a company that's worth a billion dollars, that's generating, you know, 50 million or hundred million dollars in revenue, that's already a business, you know, and it's not, it's not early stage. And it's sort of, it's funny, it's sort of the same realization that you and I had um, when we were talking about Bitcoin in early 19, I thought to myself, this is not an emerging asset anymore, right? This is a, an established asset, and I don't know why people don't see it yet. And I sort of see this as the same way. Um, and so we've waded into this, you know, into this area. 
Um, and so far, I, I don't think really there are that many competitors out there. My guess is in this space, you're going to get inundated with new companies coming into your criteria because the space is moving fast and there's going to be somebody in the DeFi space who makes it into that. There's going to be a bunch of companies that start falling into this new category where they, they're, they're larger. So, I mean, it's going to be an embarrassment of riches as this space grows because it's moving so fast. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, look at BlockFi. Uh, two years ago, it had a $50 million valuation. And then last summer, it was $500 million, And now they've just completed a raise at $2.8 billion. And so it's one of the fastest uh, rises that I can remember. And if you look at who they're backed by, they're, they really are backed by some uh, some of the heavyweights in the investment world. So, you know, you may think that 2.8 sounds like a big number, but it's certainly a number that um, many of these uh, investors are very comfortable with because they, you know, they're thinking about the company potentially being worth 10 or 20 billion. I mean, it, it I, you know, uh, otherwise they, they wouldn't be investing. But there is a, a large universe of companies worth under 400. I mean, probably maybe even 50 to 100 different companies. And we have them on our sort of target list. We're watching them. Um, it, you know, rev I mean, market valuation isn't the only metric, but I feel like if you have to draw a line in the sand somewhere, that's sort of the line where we feel like a business has gotten, has been sort of de-risked, has moved out of the uh, sort of developing uh, category. You know, look, that being said, the VCs, I always say this, the VCs are buying the company at one and they're going to sell it to us at a hundred because we think it's going to a thousand, right? And so we're not going to make, you know, the 50X in a year that some of these DeFi guys have. We're not going to, uh, we're also not going to have any zeros. So it's just, a, it's a, it's a de-risked, less volatile way to play the growth in the overall ecosystem. Because look, I, I am a super proponent of Bitcoin. I think it's going to three, 400,000, potentially even more, um, you know, store of value. I think a very clear, also has greater functionality as we've talked about as a network. But, you know, there is a whole world growing out there. The central bank digital currencies are going to be uh, moving on digital rails. The stable coin business, uh, and the yield, uh, we should talk about this later on, the yield that is being offered um, in this space. Again, there are credit considerations, but uh, I don't think the, the, the general population is aware that you can buy a dollar stable coin uh, and earn, you know, four, five, six, in some cases, eight, nine, 10%. But um, I just think that that world is coming to the overall population. And I know that's not on Bitcoin and it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with Bitcoin and people in the space might not like that. But um, I think that the most powerful, this is the last thing I'm saying, the most, and I've been thinking a lot about this recently, you know, the most powerful things from the digital asset world that are, that are working are things where there's a very strong need. And in the case of Bitcoin, there was a very strong need for another store of value. We've talked about this. There, there are a shortage of, of, of stores of value. We have gold. Uh, there, you know, there used to be the yen. Um, you know, if you're worried about debasement, if you're worried, you know, about uh, just your, you know, uh, not just debasement, but just uh, risks where you feel safe in a way. Now, I don't know that, you know, Bitcoin has, has plenty of risks uh, as well, but there is a shortage, there's a need in the world for more store of value, let's say instruments as an investor, okay? Just as right now there is a need in the world for yield. And so, this is one of the reasons I think the stablecoin business and yield on stablecoin is really going to explode uh, this year. Whether now, here's a question about yeah. this, Dan. Yeah. Is, doesn't it just 
force all the banks to arbitrage it. I mean, are they connected to the money markets or will it stay separate to the money markets? That's the big question. Yeah. Well, no, I think that eventually they have to get involved, but I don't think the banks even get it yet. And, you know, all of the banks and the custodians that we've seen in the last sort of three, four months, they're into Bitcoin. And it's sort of funny in a way, but they're not into anything else. because They don't even actually really, I don't think, really understand Bitcoin, but they get it enough and they understand that their clients want them to sell Bitcoin and, and also in most cases, Ethereum as well, uh, especially now that Ethereum is also on the CME. You know, it's it's become... Uh, you know, more of a first, more of a first class asset. But the point is, I don't think that the banks are even aware of what's going on. And I don't think they understand, uh, you know, what, what's happening in, in DeFi. Not, you know, of course, there are genius guys within the IT department at banks. I'm talking about the leadership, you know, the guys who can wake up one day and say, listen, I want to put a hundred million dollars. I want to hire a hundred people, and we are going to arb, you know, these yields out. Right? They're way, way, way behind. I and I and and banks aren't really risk taking organizations anymore. And that's another reason why this has popped up because the banks, after 08, vacated, you know, the uh, vacated the business of really making money. And I think also offering interesting products for people. The reason these guys have capitulated in the last three, four months is because the clients have said, are you kidding me? Uh, you, I can't even buy Bitcoin through you. You know, I'm going to move my account. And so all of a sudden you get a bony or, a, you know, Northern U.S. Northern Trust or a, any of these traditional people coming on, uh, coming on and doing it. But they don't really understand the you know, what's going on there yet. No, I mean, it, it's really interesting. Even when you look at the Bitcoin futures and the premium that they trade to spot, I mean, it's yeah. gigantic, right? So the yields implied in the futures like 20% a year. Right, because people can trade futures who aren't, you know, who can't trade, you know, Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin is not a security. So that precludes a huge chunk of people. That's why the grayscale trust has been in such demand. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think there are ARB opportunities and I think some of the smarter hedge funds, of course, are probably there, you know, the, the really, the top notch guys, uh, you know, with quant teams, I'm sure they're, they're deep in the weeds on this, but there are very few guys like that. Yeah. Cause they're, they're actually, who's driving a lot of the yields for the borrowing of, <coughs> of crypto and stable coins and stuff. I mean, it's it's really interesting. What, how do you think through the security in the space? Again, it's it's complex to know what risk you're actually taking to get that yield. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm not sure. I think it was on. Um, I think it was on Real Vision Crypto. Someone on your team did an interview with Alex Mashinsky of Celsius. Yeah, and and he explained where the yield comes from. So I would suggest anyone listen to that uh, instead of me, you know, as a as a part time hacker in that area. I mean, Alex, I think, really uh, explained it well. And, you know, along with Compound and BlockFi, those are sort of the, you know, the leaders in the borrowing and lending space. Um, so I think it it comes from a bunch of different places. Uh, obviously, there's credit risk. And obviously, there is risk there, um, and I think it's it's also manufactured differently at different places. So, and that's a whole separate world. That's sort of centralized finance. The whole DeFi world. That's a whole other thing um, that I, I can't pretend to explain here. And you should have Ben Foreman on, uh, you know, from Parify, who I think you have interviewed before. Uh, ben is a phenomenal sort of DeFi guru. Any, any questions I would have, I, I would just ask him, um, uh, you know, specific things. He could take you through where all the yield is manufactured. But from a, a, a bigger macro investor perspective, I think what, what you have to know is that, yes, there is some quasi, or, or what we would characterize, old guys would characterize as credit risk. Um, but look, 
I don't think that there's that kind of risk in investing in a company, in the companies in the space. They're operating businesses. Yes, there's credit risk, but I don't need to get into the weeds. And I have people on my team who can do that anyway. Um, so that may not be a satisfy, uh, but I prefer to be like perfectly honest. accurate. Yeah, perfectly it's accurate honest. also. And look, I yeah. think Real Vision Crypto role is phenomenal. I mean, you and I talked about this idea a year ago, and I, I think it's a huge, uh, I think it's going to become huge. I think it, it just, the quality of the content is awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's nowhere else you get this amount of incredible content about every single far corner of this whole space. I agree. I, I, I agree. It's phenomenal. It's just that now you have to have someone in the legacy world give a crap, right, and put a nice, you know, big valuation on it. <laughs> uh, which it deserves, which it deserves because it's it's unique information, and um, I, no one else is even close. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So um, the third the category, is, the third the category, third category, right, is blockchain infrastructure, and you know, I mean, that's something very obvious uh, that everyone would, would, you know, understands uh, you know, if you take a look at a company like Paxos, our old friend, Chad, uh, who's built that company. I mean, as you know, he built PayPal's, um, connection into this digital asset world. And so PayPal now offers, you know, a bunch of cryptocurrency off their platform for their 340 million people because Paxos, you know, built that 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 bridge i bought my first ever bitcoin yeah using its bits which was the thing yeah. that him and neil built first that yeah. ends up now becoming the engine for this yeah. whole paypal thing i know that was where i bought my first ever bitcoin right right so you know you say to me do you you can make one bet and you can be long bitcoin you can make another bet by being long chad and the team and their vision and what they're doing and he has this vision of tokenizing the world, and I think it's, uh, I think it's a legitimate one. There are going to be lots of different ways to go about it, uh, you know. But he's a guy who I would want to have an investment with. I, you know, I believe in his, uh, in in his vision and what they're doing. So what a lot of people won't remember is, Chad was the person who kind of gave the first tutorials on Real Vision six years ago to get people up to understand what is blockchain all of that i mean chad is for not well you and i have known him for a long time he's phenomenal him and emil woods have, are the right. reason we got into the space absolutely i mean you know absolutely it was one of those at one of those conferences down you know down in the caymans where it was just us sitting around the round table talking about stuff so you know it's not that i'm not saying that this concept is a, a better bet than a uh, Bitcoin or better bet than you know early uh, stage investments. I just think it's a it's a sort of de-risk bet on the space that I'm comfortable with, and that I wanted for my own portfolio, which is really what the driver of this whole thing is. Is that this is the broad exposure I wanted for uh, DTAP Capital? So yeah, I mean, and you know, as you said, you did this in. Uh, farmland REITs and you've done it in gold. I mean, it's, a, right. it's your chosen way of expressing a long-term macro bet that you can't mess around with your trade because you have to build a business around it. That's ex that's exactly right. And there's some, you know, there's something to be said for not being able to take profit. Uh, you know, I mean, really, because it's tempting. Uh, I'm sure you, just like me, I've put the Bitcoin out of my mind and it's in a lockbox outside of my daily activity. And I, I don't think about it and, you know, I don't do any computations. It's just there. And in five, six, seven years, or if it hits three, four, five hundred thousand, then, you know, maybe I'll, I'll think about something to do. But it's it's very hard to just do that. Uh, also, when you're building a business, there, there are other ways to build value, other revenue streams. Um, and for me, I hope that uh, this will also lead to, this is a toe dip for me, into figuring out what kind of operating business I might want to start in this space eventually. Um, you know, so it's also a way for me to learn more, dig deeper in, um, and hopefully find a way, you know, to... to to start another 
uh, operating business? I think one of the things you touched upon is something that I've been thinking about, and I've talked only a little bit about, is, right, we're macro guys. It's pretty easy to buy something that's been super bombed out. You've got your thesis. It's pretty easy to buy a breakout and trade that for a bit on a nice chart pattern with some news flow. It's pretty easy to try and short a top in whatever it is. The hardest thing in macro, the literal hardest thing, is an exponential curve. We're not, we, we can't do it. Right? And I'm seeing it already amongst all the macro guys that I know who are still more in traditional macro world. They're already like, that's gone too far. You've got to start yeah. shorting it. The risks are too big. And yeah. I see this narrative because it's really hard in macro to, to ride that reflexive exponential rise. Yeah, it, it is hard, but to be honest, uh, that's sort of been my my thing. I, I I'm I'm less I, you know, I've been less interested in catching squiggles, and I I think actually, unless you're doing it twenty four seven as your full time daytime job, and you have you know x number of years experience, I think trading crypto is is insane. Uh, I think it's totally nuts. I think you have to allocate a percentage of your portfolio and you have to leave it and you have to give yourself parameters and just sort of put it out of out of mind. But to tell you the truth, one of the reasons that um, I don't find it that difficult is because probably, you know, the most formative experience I had in my career, I mean, of course, there's working with Druckenmiller, but um, was early in my career working with Julian Robertson at Tiger and Julian had that long-term hold mentality and he could hold things for years and years. And I saw him, you know, and this is, again, it was, I, I was almost right out of college. I was very fortunate to be, you know, to be given that opportunity to sit there on the, you know, on the front line of watching massive, literally gigantic positions being put on I mean, we used to have the fund at the time in the early 90s was $3 billion when I was there, okay? And we would have $300, $400 million daily swings. So think about that in our swaption portfolio. We had all these European interest rate bets on, as you remember, 92, 93. And he never flinched. I mean, he, you know, if anything, he... You know, that was where I sort of learned the value of having that long term. How did he have the conviction? Because you know what it's like. As soon as you put a trade on, every broker is trying to get you out of it. And half of your friends are. Yeah. Um, everyone calls you an idiot. And holding on is actually difficult because of that, that all of the contrary news flow. I mean, I've learned to filter it out, but. How do you do yeah, it? Yeah, I think, yeah, it, it, it's hard to filter out and it's experience. Um, but, you know, uh, well, at least in Julian's case, uh, when you're Julian, you know, I, I, you know, the people he's listening to are, you know, are, uh, you know, four or five of sort of the, 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 the greatest, uh, you know, other investors or analysts in the space. So, I, you know, I, he, you know, at least when, when I was working for him, I, I never you know, there was never much wavering uh, at all. And again, sometimes that can get you into trouble if things really change and you miss it. But, you know, the conviction is built up through lots of hard work and research and really believing that, you know, you have an edge, you see something out there that the world doesn't see. And I, I think, for instance, if you're a Bitcoin holder today, I was thinking about this, you know, when we were talking about it in 19 or in, for you in 2012 even, but, you know, or in March or April of last year, it was pretty clear, uh, you know, below 10,000 to us, it was very clear given what was going on in the macro that you had to buy it and basically just hold as much as you could handle. And now it's up 10X, you know, from when we were pounding the table and, um, you know, uh, you've got all sorts of people coming out acknowledging it. So, of course, as a macro trader, you think, oh, well, now everyone acknowledges it. I've got to get out because I bought at five. It's now at 50. 
thank you very much, right? But what's different about this bet is that the people who are buying it now, they still don't understand what the big driver is to take it to four or 500,000. Not really. I mean, some of them do, of course, you know, of course. But I think generally speaking, they don't. And it's this, the importance of this Bitcoin network capital B, the mechanism of how the Bitcoin machine works and what it does, and that it really, you know, it, it is the value protocol uh, potentially for the, the internet. And that it is, as you've said, and I've quoted you before, you know, this pristine collateral. Um, Bitcoin is so many different things. It's not just a store of value. Uh, you know how I, I kind of think the digital gold narrative is kind of nonsense in a way, but you know it it it, it almost limits people's thinking about what Bitcoin That's is. Right. They say, "Oh, it's it's digital gold." I get it. Okay, I either believe it or I don't. They don't actually understand what's been invented here by Satoshi and what lived through five or six years in the beginning of just like you know. Uh, the, the the wild the wildness of just the the environment meaning um, it, it 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 took quite a few years for it to become established in a way that at least I felt comfort that it was past its hey it could go to zero phase I mean Wentz's famous thing just put one percent that was put one percent in your portfolio because a lot of people thought it could go to zero. Right. And so you're only going to risk 1%. And I think there's zero chance it's going to zero. Certainly now, and even la even when we talked, I think that was sort of my insight. And so the reason why 50,000 doesn't really mean much to me is because I don't hear people talking about uh, some of the things that I think are really valuable about Bitcoin, number one. And number two, I think only one to 2% of the entire world have crypto accounts or crypto wallets. So what that actually is, it's more akin to 1995, 96 in the development of the internet. Because at that time, only 1% of the world had internet access. And so for me, I feel like this space is kind of around there uh, in terms of development. And if you look at the uh, rate of the adoption of the internet over the following 10 years. So from 95 to 05, it grew by 15 times. So I think this digital asset ecosystem is going to grow at least uh, 15 times. Um, I think it's growing at a faster rate now. So 10 years from now, I don't think it's crazy to think that 15 or 20% of the world have crypto accounts or crypto wallets. Right. So that's how I'm thinking about it. So it's not so no. that's why I'm ignoring the fact that it's moved 10x and that people who, you know, you know, they're parroting things that we discussed a year or two ago. It's not a trade. This is not a trade. Right. But OK, so let's fast forward. Let's say it gets to where I think it's going to finish this year. Let's say it gets to 250 plus. Right. So you're now, even more bullish than me. I wouldn't put a 250 number on this year. I don't know where it could go this year. It could be 70,000 this year, or it could be 250. Yeah, go ahead. I'm you sorry. Know, I, you know, I, I've just done a lot of work that gives me some sort of confidence. Could be dead wrong as well. No. But let's say it does get there, right? We both think it's going to go much further over time. So we get to the point in the halving cycle where historically we've seen prices plummet. Now, how do you think with the institutions coming into the space that the halving cycle is going to play out the, 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 the negative side of the halving cycle? Do you think it's going to be cushioned somewhat by institutions? How do you think it plays out? Does, does the structure No, change? No, this is nature. This is nature. It is going to go up to the number that it's going to go up to, and then it will have a massive correction. <laughs> and it will have a message. And my guess is is that a lot of those institutions will be selling it at the low. Because I think that it's the right exposure for certain institutions. Uh, 
you know, endowments, for instance, or funds that have a long-term view. Um, but a lot of the world isn't set up that way, and certainly not corporates. I mean, I think that I think it's wonderful that Michael Saylor is doing what he's doing, and the guy is a godsend and uh, I, I think a ph phenomenal uh, risk taker and actually a phenomenal macro guy. Um, but I don't think that that's appropriate for like 90% of the corporate world. I mean, they're never going to be able to do that. They're the people that are going to buy Bitcoin are the people who are looking for not only just a store of value, but who, who understand its value proposition. And to me, that will be investors. I think it's a nice thought. You know, great that Elon put some on the balance sheet. Great that Jack, uh, you know, put some on the balance sheet. But these guys are at the cutting edge of the cutting edge, right? Some company out in the middle of whatever that makes widgets, they're not putting their money into Bitcoin. I mean, they, they don't even own gold. You know, they probably are still sitting in bonds at uh, 50 basis points. So, you know, this is that's a case where I think they're a little ahead. To me, it's not the the corporates that are going to be driving this next leg. It's the it's the investment community, and as we've talked about, you know, the hundred and ninety trillion dollars that are sitting in cash or bonds, you know, or cash plus duration out there. Uh, you know, you don't need much of that hundred and ninety trillion to to move into uh, Bitcoin and into the ecosystem generally uh, to get you to the numbers that you're talking about. But no, I think no, this is nature. It's like the Fibonacci sequence of rabbit herding. Uh, it's the same ma rabbit mating, it's the same thing. So this is what guys like us who are in the markets understand, but people out there in the business world have a very hard time dealing with. And by the way, this is one of the reasons that I've set up 10T as well, because in the last correction, when Bitcoin went down 80%, uh, the value of a basket of these companies did not go down that much. And in, in fact, some of them didn't go down at all because some of the companies actually are not really correlated to the price of, of Bitcoin. So that's another reason why we've had very good traction because the volatility profile is different it's a, another couple of things I want to flip by you just to get your thoughts is, look, you love art, um, and we're now seeing the rise of NFTs, which is not only just for art, but that's one of the things that's happening. What are your thoughts of NFTs? I mean, it seems like this is maybe the DeFi for the next cycle. It's the next big thing that's coming on the horizon. Yeah, I, I mean, it's very recent. I mean, you know, I... Uh, you know, as you can tell, I have this painting behind me. I mean, I, I do focus a little bit on uh, some things going on in the art world. Um, my, so look, I, I think it's going to be very big. And um, actually, Pomp has written a nice note about this uh, as well. He published something uh, maybe a month or so ago. The auctions um, that are on the Winklevoss's platform uh, was it Nifty Gateway? They that 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 um I think that's a great business. It's it's not even the first inning. It's like the first pitch of the first batter. Um, my uh, initial sense from speaking to my friends in the art world is that the quality of the art for people who have a proper eye, let's say, is not very good. And so at the moment, you know, you're looking at. Christie's is going to auction off some of Beeple's work. And I think that, you know, you should follow some of the sort of leading artists on, on Twitter. They're there. Um, and there's some other people who you can follow to, to learn a little bit more. Um, so I think that the, the once the quality of the art becomes what I call proper art, so that someone who's been a dealer for 30 years, who has a great eye says, you know, that's really an innovative vision, or that's really done in a very interesting way, then I think the market will really take off. Uh, because a lot of a lot of it is just not really nice to look at, you know, <laughs> or a lot of it isn't, you know, I'm not saying it has to be aesthetic necessarily. But I think that's when 
you get again the legacy world. Yeah, if the new Banksy turns up as a digital artist with NFT, it's the right. whole space is going to explode. Right, and I, I think there might be there might be some people out there potentially, but look as the as the dollar value goes up, you're going to see some really quality artists move into the space. And so I'll just say, uh, as an aside, I actually am involved in a project. That, <laughs> okay, so I asked the right person. Well, not really. It's too <laughs> early yet. Maybe the next time we chat, we can we could talk about that. But um, uh, I, that's where I mean I, I think again, the sp- uh, the 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 real whoosh, you know, the the inflection point in the in the hockey stick comes when you know the 95% of the world uh, of people in the traditional world whether it's in the traditional banking world or in this case in the more traditional art world once they have their light bulb moment then it will get lifted uh you know lifted up and i think that comes when when pieces hold what, what they call more uh, artistic merit a little bit another thing i i saw today a friend of mine sent me a whatsapp that he had bought a bunch of these NBA clips yeah. that they've auctioned with NFTs. I mean, he's already bought, you know, he, you could buy like 40 of these things for like 15 bucks. And he's yeah. already up like he's already up like hundred times his money in, in a right. week. Right. Uh, so it, yeah, I don't I don't really know much about that. I mean, I I'm not really following it that closely. It is hyper speculative, um, very interesting. Um, but I you know, I think you probably Novo probably is the guy to talk to about that. Yeah, and I think Barry's probably because his understanding of Decentraland and all that kind of stuff. Right. He kind of was pretty early on with kind of telling me about and telling you as well about the the tokenization and what this all means because gaming is the other huge space. And again, I haven't got the bandwidth to take in all of this stuff. Yeah, There's me neither. So much going on. I mean, look, we're not micro guys at the end of the day. And I think after 30 years of being macro guys, I think, you know, that's, we've sort of made our bed in a way. Like we can do a deep dive into specific things, but we can't do a deep dive into every specific thing. And that's exactly. the that's the difference. And, and our strength has, has been focusing on the macro and this big, the big tidal wave uh, that's coming in whatever area that is. And so I want to stay really focused on, uh, on on my current project, and once that sort of you know really gets to a place where I want it to be, you know, then we can you know maybe look at some different things. But um, yeah, I, I I'm you know I, I'm probably not the right guy. No. So final question: How are you dealing with Ethereum and any of the other larger interesting protocols? You invested yeah. at all yourself? No, I. You know, I um, I didn't. I you know I, I don't know if you recall, but uh, I did. Uh, I, I run this investment committee for an endowment, and we did put money uh, into the space. We we actually did eighty five percent Bitcoin and about fifteen, or maybe it was like eighty twenty in into Ethereum. That was Ethereum was at one hundred and eighty dollars. So you know. Uh, someone is going to be getting a scholarship to the school, uh, I think, or I- at least a, a few. Um, no, so meaning that back then I saw that as sort of a, a good way to, that would be a good way to make that allocation, but I, I did not. I just left it, my, you know, DTAP in, in, in Bitcoin. Look, I think it's valid, of course, and, you know, it just, um, your analysis that it's five years behind uh, is probably a, a good mental model. Uh, I know there are lots of naysayers and I, I know all of that. Um, and some of the, the lookalikes, as you said, like a polka dot or the improvements on, or however you wanna call it, Ethereum killers, you know, I think they'll find their way or maybe they won't, right? And basically I don't wanna make a bet on that because that's not my expertise. If we had a team that I built uh, of people who could do in-depth analysis on it, then I'd have an opinion. But I think the way that I'm playing that, I mean, 
through the gateways or the next gen financial services or the blockchain infrastructure people through the companies and the smartest guys in the in the in that space it's just easier for me to say listen do i want to bet on myself in blockchain infrastructure or do i want to bet on chad you know cascarilla right it's a pretty easy decision that i don't have to kill a lot of brain cells over right you know so but, but i think this you know this is the most important thing i think of this whole interview right you've been all the way through totally honest to say i don't know it's not my job to know i'm a macro guy and i'm looking for what is the easiest cleanest way to represent my macro view and it is i understand that there's all these exciting flashy things in the corner I'm just going to assume that somebody's going to tie one of those into a business that I can invest in so I don't have to take the risk in picking stuff. And I'll keep with my Bitcoin. I mean, that's a very, most people can't do that. It's really interesting. <laughs> you know, to say, and to be honest and say, I don't know. It's not my job to know everything. Because as you know, in this space, it's ludicrous. People are so smart. I mean, Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, it is just, I've never seen anything like it. And that's another reason why, I sort of see myself in this world for the next, you know, 10, 15 years. And I, I mean, I said that even two years ago, I could, I could tell. Um, yeah. And look, I, I don't know that we're, I, I'm not trying to be the number one performer. I don't care about, I, I don't need to make the most amount of return. Uh, I, I just don't care. I think that these, these businesses. There's enough returns there. That's the point. There's enough. Right, there's, there, there's enough there. If you look at, you know, where just as an example, where Coinbase raised money in their early rounds, uh, it's done pretty well. I don't know that I don't know how it can go from 80 billion, I mean, to 800 billion. Uh, maybe it does. I, I don't know. Um, but like that, that's not a bet I, w I would make either. Right. So um, but, you know, from. A billion to ten billion, or three billion to ten to fifteen billion. I think that, you know, I I want to, um, I, I want to have a de-risked bet, sort of what I would call a even a picks and shovels bet, um, you know, uh, exposure to the space. And um, look, you you can't. There's a lot of flashy things there. But look, as an example, I mentioned before the. The explosion in the trading of Dogecoin. I mean, Dogecoin is ridiculous. I would never own that or even think about it for one second. But look, one of these companies had a massive boost because of it and actually profited from it. So, in a way, I would have exposure to Dogecoin. It's just not the direct exposure. And so, I feel like the 10 to 15 guys who I'm betting on, right? That's my, I'm betting on them to be smarter than me. And um, I like that bet. I like I that like bet. It too. I like I it mean, too. Would you bet on, would you bet on yourself or would you bet on Jesse in that yeah. space, right? Actually, I'm not, I bring nothing to it, but he's right. been in the, in the trenches forever. He knows his game. Yeah. Dan, super interesting as ever. Yeah. Good to pick Thanks. your brains on this. It's look, really Thanks. exciting what you're up to. And again, I just love the way you've structured the whole thing. It's just really smart. Well done. Thank you, Raul. Lo love chatting. Talk to yeah, you soon. Yeah, and, and I'll see you very soon. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.